Hey, thanks for making it to Veterans Info Tap. I'm glad you made it. Let's talk about six ways to increase your household income. Now, look, here's the reality. Inflation has gone up. COLA doesn't move enough in order to really help to combat that inflation. And in my opinion, inflation is going to increase here in the next few months as well, which is uh, kind of a double whammy for us because not only did we get a lower COLA, we're also getting uh, hit with some higher inflation, I think, is going to be happening. So it's more important now than ever that we as a veteran community, dependent community, uh, what have you, uh, the veteran sphere is what I like to call it, uh, that we look for ways to increase our household income uh, because that takes the pressure off, right? Um, it, it, what's the saying? Money doesn't buy happiness, but it's a hell of a down payment, right? So let's jump into it here. Hit the thumbs up for me, subscribe, share with a friend, all that good stuff. I really appreciate it. And look, if you're not a member, consider joining. It does help the channel. It's a good way to support the channel. And it helps me to find you guys in the comments. I really appreciate it. Thank you to all you members. All right. So I'm going to go through them one at a time and just give a high. This is just kind of mostly me just giving you a high level overview of several different ways. I'll give you some dollar amounts uh, on the last three uh, for sure, uh, but just to kind of put it in your awareness, right? So number one is filing a claim if you've never filed a claim, right? So many of you who are watching this, you, you've you already filed claims. You already have a service-connected disability or disabilities. Uh, so for you, it could be filing a new claim for a new condition that you've never filed for before that would be considered service-connected. Now, here's my suggestion to everyone. I did it myself. Our memories are not as good as we may think they are. Order all of your military records, all your service treatment records, all of that stuff. You can do that uh, with the SF, SF-180 form, SF-180 form, uh, and order them from the National Archives. It's a fairly easy form and there's uh, where to mail it for your different times in service and what branch you served in. Get all of that information in and start thumbing through it. In the meantime, <clears throat> you should do two things. Number one and two. Number one, file an intent to file. Number two, order your records. Hopefully, ideally, you get that within the, the year's time frame, right? Then you have that year block for your intent to file. Hopefully, let's say it takes eight months, hopefully, right? So your stuff shows up eight months from now and you start thumbing through it and you're like, oh, I never realized that I complained about migraine headaches when I was in. Or I never realized that I complained about heartburn when I was in. Or I forgot that I twisted my knee when I was in. Or I forgot, whatever, right? You get the picture. So now all of a sudden you may have a nexus, which is important. You need to link your current condition to your time in service. If you talked about it when you were in, that's your nexus. You're linking your condition to your time in service. You're proving it. So you don't need to have a diagnosis while you were in. You can get a diagnosis 30 years later, right? So let's use migraines for an example, or even GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, bad heartburn, right? We'll use those two. Let's say you complained somewhere in your records when you were in. You might have checked the box that said that you have heartburn and you have headaches. Uh, on an annual physical health assessment, maybe your final health assessment when you were getting out. It's a self-attesting form where you just check the boxes. Maybe you did. You don't remember what you checked. So now you get that and you see it. Awesome. Now, in the meantime, the past 30 years or however many years, you have never been diagnosed for heartburn, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or migraines. Never got diagnosed because it's obvious. You know you have those things. So what do you do? You go to the store, you get uh, you know, your bottle of Tums, your Mylanta, you buy a bunch of Motrin and aspirin or Excedrin or whatever, and you just self-medicate with over-the-counter uh, drugs, right? And then you move on and you live your life. And now you see that that stuff is mentioned in your records. Well, now you need a diagnosis. So you have to go to your doctor and get diagnosed. And when they ask you, how long have you been experiencing this? Oh, ever since I was in. See, look, I actually mentioned it here, right? And show them that 
because now you're going to want them to also write you just to double down, right? It's better to have too much evidence in your favor than not. Have them write you a nexus letter as well. You know, my take on this is, look, doctor, you're having a conversation with the doctor who's a business, right? Especially if it's a small doctor, right? Smaller, you know, doctor uh, and not working for a big, you know, gigantic hospital. They are looking at you and you're asking them for something, right? A nexus letter. Now, there's two ways to, to do this, right? Hey, I'd like to, to, to have you write me a, a letter basically explaining that my condition is as a result of my service or that it manifested during my service. Uh, can you do that for me? I'd really appreciate it because I, I want to you know, get this over to the VA um, so I can have all my stuff there at the VA. Okay, well, that's an okay way to do it. They might do it for you. But um, a better way, I think, anyway, is, hey, look, doctor, I really appreciate it. What I, what I really need from you is I need a letter explaining, you know, same thing, the Nexus letter. And you can even give them an example, right? You can write it down if you want. And let them know that you need this Nexus letter because you want to, you're, you're in the process of filing a claim with the VA so you can be reimbursed for your medical expenses right? Which is essentially true. They're reimbursing you with compensation. And what are you going to do with that compensation? Well, you're going to pay your medical bill uh, for one, right? So it kind of takes the edge off of, hey, I'm going to lose you as a patient is what I'm thinking. Anyway, so now you've ordered your records, you have your diagnosis, you're now able to file that claim, right? So that's a new claim. So number two, God, this has taken much longer. I'm going to move a little bit faster for you. Number two is your existing conditions. You should absolutely review your current conditions that you have service connected with the VA. And what I mean by that is you should go into the schedule of ratings on the VA's website. You can Google search schedule of ratings VA and it'll take you right to it. There's a bunch of different books. It's a little bit cumbersome, I admit. You can also, if you would like, put in schedule of rate VA schedule of ratings for your specific condition and a lot of the attorney sites will have it snapshotted out for you and you can read it on their site <clears throat> now the beauty here is that if you know that you're rated at we'll say 10 percent for migraines and now you're reading the criteria okay yes i do meet the criteria for a 10 percent oh wow but i also meet the criteria for a 30 percent in fact, I might actually meet the criteria for a 50% for migraines. Well, guess what? You should be filing for an increase. That's important to know, right? So you can read exactly what the VA is looking for for the specific ratings for your conditions via the schedule of ratings. So do that and determine if you can file for an increase on any of your conditions. The next one, number three, remember I'm going through six. So number three, secondary conditions okay so now instead of creating a nexus to your time and service a secondary condition is creating a nexus to a current service connected condition so uh, uh, an example here would be um, my service connected bad back keeps me up at night and I can't sleep Therefore, I now have a secondary condition of insomnia due to my back condition, right? So that would be an example. Another example would be your right leg is really messed up and so you limp around a lot. You're overcompensating with your left leg and now over time, your left leg starts to have issues wherever it is, your knee, your ankle, whatever, right? So you're compensating with the other one. So now it goes bad. That now becomes a secondary condition due to your right leg service connected uh, conditions. So look at uh, conditions that can be related to your service connected conditions. A way to do that is you could actually Google search secondary conditions to X, right? So uh, tinnitus ringing in the ear may have secondary conditions of migraines may have secondary conditions of depression, anxiety, those types of things. So type in your condition and secondary conditions and see what pops up um, to see if you have any of those. Next one is number four. And that is, look, if you're rated somewhere between 60 and 
and you're not working, you may want to consider filing for TDIU. That is total individual, uh, total disability individual unemployability, TDIU. Now, what that will do for you is it will bump you to the 100% mark for VA compensation. Now, you're still a rated veteran at whatever, 70%, 80%, what have you. I've done videos on the past on how to qualify for TDIU. This is just a high-level overview, right? So instead of being paid out at 70% or 80% or 60% or 90%, you will jump up to the 100% rating. Uh, and that is very important. 100% rating, if it's just you and a spouse, right? You and a spouse, let's see, a veteran with a spouse is $3,823 today. That's going to go up 3.2%. Uh, with your January payment so for 2024 so $3,823 versus let's say that if you were at 70% that's $1,800 so you're talking about a $2,000 a month difference so again if you're a veteran who is not working and you can tie your not working to one of your disabilities, one of your service-connected disabilities, that it just makes it too difficult, right? Maybe you have PTSD and you just can't you can't be around people um, or what have you, uh, or you have a back condition, knee condition, whatever. You can't stand, you can't sit, you can't, you know, the pain causes you, you know, whatever. Uh, think about it and think it through, and you may qualify for TDIU, Total Disability Individual Unemployability, pushing you to that 100% mark, which would be helpful, especially if you're not working currently. All right, next one, uh, number five is VR and E, okay? So Veterans Readiness and Employment, it used to be uh, Veterans uh, Rehabilitation and Employment or Education, I can't remember. Anyway, so anyway, VR and E, Veterans uh, Readiness and Employment Program will pay you out a stipend Per month while you're in while you're going through that program. Now there's different uh, percentages depending on if you're in service currently and getting ready to get out, or if you're a veteran already. Uh, it's either a 10 or 20 percent rating. But as long as you have a rating with the VA, um, you might want to consider filing for VR and E. You don't need to. Okay, so. It's an employment program is what the VA likes to, so it's important to understand their little umbrella and how they think. So vr &E is an employment program. You're gonna sit with a count, so one, you have to meet the criteria to apply. You apply, then you have to be deemed eligible by a counselor. So you'll meet with the counselor. The counselor will decide, hey look, your service-connected conditions really aren't conducive to your current line of work uh, the things that you've done in the past. We need to shift you into this line of work that meets your uh, interests and your abilities given your current uh, service-connected conditions. Uh, and so therefore, we're going to go ahead and admit you into the program, but your AA degree in X isn't enough to get you the job you need uh, over here. So we're going to put you back into school uh, and and uh, have you finish out a bachelor's degree in whatever, right? So now you're going to go to school, and that is going to be however you like, right? It could be in person, or it could be 100% online. They don't really care. So you could do it if you're working, right, and you get uh, approved for the program. <clears throat> you're working, you get approved for the program, now you're going to school, they will pay for your school for you, right, which is important. So your tuition and all that stuff's paid for. If you need a laptop or a printer or things like that, they will also, uh, or they're supposed to anyway, uh, get you that type of equipment. Then on top of that, you will get a monthly stipend. And this is where the increasing your monthly pay comes from. So if you, for example, are uh, doing some sort of institutional program like a school and you're going full time and let's say that you have a, a spouse and a child your stipend would be one thousand one hundred and twenty three dollars per month tax-free so you're gonna get an extra eleven $1 hundred bucks a month 
while you're in the program. So that can help you with your finances. Um, so that's that's another option for you is VR and E. Now, a little side note, if you happen to have any post 9-11 GI Bill, uh, they can utilize the GI Bill calculation for you if you have any remaining, even if it's one month's worth, they'll basically duplicate that and run that out through the program. So, you know, if you're in an area like the Bay Area in California or other high cost living areas, uh, you know, you could be looking at 3,000, 4,000 or more per month while you're in that program. Very helpful. Uh, next one and the, uh, the last one is Chapter 35. I like this program. Uh, this is specific to 100% uh, veterans. Uh, so 100% permanent and total opens up the door to Chapter 35. It is an educational benefit for your spouse and dependents and they will be paid $1,488 a month while they are attending a VA approved institution of higher learning, whatever, um, while they're in this program. It could be 100% online, not a big deal, uh, and they can receive, again, $1,488 going full time per month. That's tax free. However, the caveat here is that that specific program does not cover tuition you have to pay for the tuition. So let's just use easy numbers. Let's say to go full time to school X online is $488 per month. Well, you're getting $1488 per month. So $488 goes to pay the school and you get $1,000 left over every month tax free to boost your income. So with that, that is six ways to increase your income uh, here in these tight times, right? With inflation just skyrocketing. So I hope uh, that helps. I hope that you got something out of it. I really appreciate you guys so much. Have a great one. And remember, if we don't take care of each other, something went wrong.